Welcome back to Media Monarchy, everybody. It's James Evan Pilato, your host, Webmaster DJ, and so much more from MediaMonarchy.com. You know, there are a lot of terrible, gross, or even offensive band names out there like Diarrhea Planet or The Crucifix. But what happens when you try and patent your gross, offensive band name and the patent office says no? Now, one of the biggest stories going on around in a quick search gets me 10 plus thousand results when you search for The Slants. And I know he is super busy and I really appreciate him taking the time. Simon Tam of The Slants joins us on Media Monarchy. Thanks so much, man. Thanks so much for having me. So it's funny. I think you said you found out, like a lot of us find out things, you found out on Twitter. You woke up to find that you had won your court case, right? Yeah. <laughs> It was uh, just the most surreal moment, uh, you know, just one of the Twitter push notifications on my phone. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, it's Leland, uh, or Lee, the, the um, attorney for the ACLU who had argued with us on, in court and tagging me. And then she said something like, I love the idea of you waking up to, to victory. And I was like, what does that, what does that mean? And I was like, <laughs> is it what I think it means? And I just grabbed my laptop uh, while I was still in bed and, and just looked it up and Sure enough, the the news was already starting to boil. Uh, my attorney had sent me a message with a link to the the court decision. It was 110 pages, so I was just like sitting there, like, what 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 did they say? What's what's the answer? Um, you know, once I finally dug into it more, I realized that that we had actually won, um, which is something that I almost didn't allow myself to believe for for a little bit. I mean, it had been we've been fighting this thing for six years. Oh wow! So uh, it. Well, I was going to say, so let's actually then take that back six years ago. You've the you've been playing in your band. You're the founder and, and bass player of the Slants. You've been you've been in the band for a while. So six years ago, you 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 find success. You go, oh, I want to lock this name down so somebody else can't come along and and take my band name. Walk us through those steps, and then and then what happened? <laughs> well, actually. Um... Two things happened to even get to that point. Uh, one, we found two other bands called Yo. The Slants, uh, both in Arizona, actually. Huh. And it, they started marketing themselves as The Slants. And our fans went to their concerts thinking we were on tour, went to see the show, and then found out it was the wrong band. And um, so we realized, wow, that's, that's kind of messed up. Like, you know, how, how, how can we fix that? And then around that same time, our attorney contacted me and it's like, you know, you've been touring nationally for a while now. You've been doing all this stuff. I think you should register a trademark. He said, it's something that's pretty inexpensive. It only takes a couple of months. And then after that, you'll totally have it. Um, I didn't know it'd be something that would cost ridiculous amounts of money and take, a, you know, at over half a decade, something that... <laughs> You know, the, my court case lasts longer than most bands <laughs> if for their career. So it's it's something that was um, quite quite a shocker. But yeah, we we applied. The trademark office originally rejected it, and they said it's because our name is disparaging to people of Asian descent, which of course is kind of ridiculous considering how it's for an all Asian band. And and so we were like, well, maybe they just don't get it. Uh, uh, you know, what kind of evidence are they actually using to show that that were offensive? Uh, the attorneys showed me the court documents and it was like the trademark office was actually quoting UrbanDictionary.com and using photos of Miley Cyrus. And I just thought this is extremely offensive. Like, why would they even use this in court? And so that kind of began this really long journey where we just been fighting back and forth. Uh, originally with a ton of evidence talking about why we were or were not offensive, um, that resulted in us sending in about 2,500 pages worth of stuff, including letters from internment camp survivors, uh, one of the editors at the New American Oxford Dictionary, national surveys, I mean, on and on and on. And them continuing to say, well, the, well this uh, AsianJokes.com says it's offensive. And it, like them just using the most ridiculous, obscure stuff possible. But finally, we, we said, wait a second. If slant is really a racial slur, like you claim it is, why is it that there are 800 trademark registrations for slant? And this is the only one in all of US history that's been denied for being racist towards Asians. Like, what is it about this band that's different than all these other ones? And they said, oh, that's easy. 
It said, it is incontestable that the applicant is of Asian descent. In other words, for them, they said, we were too Asian because since we were Asian, people could go to our website, see our picture, see our name, and they'll automatically think of an outdated racial slur instead of any other possible definition. Um, so another way of saying that is anyone could register a trademark for the slants as long as they're not Asian. And because our ethnicity provided the, the context mm -hmm. for it to be uh, you know, racially charged. So then we, 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 we've been fighting that thing for that, that line of thinking. We've been fighting it for four years, uh, which ended up exposing the trademark office and the Department of Justice saying, like, look, you can't use race to deny people rights. Um, and, and also on top of that, it's, uh, you're abridging people's free speech rights, the First Amendment. And that's what the, the recent court decision was all about. Well, and that's almost, I, I bet, kind of Kafka-esque when you're told y you can't use a term that's offensive <laughs> to you. So, oh, thanks, thanks for letting me know what, yeah, I, what thank, I find offensive. Thank you for being offended on my behalf. <laughs> and, and what was really offensive to me was that in those six years, the trademark office did not talk to a single Asian about our case. They didn't talk to any Asian American organizations or, or leaders or racial justice experts or anything like that. They just assumed that they know, knew what was offensive to us, hmm. um, which you know is a little paternal, a little presumptuous. Well, uh, I, I know the the wheels of justice move pretty slowly. I think we all kind of grow up seeing movies and TV shows where we think it's going to be all slam bang and the, the <laughs> lawyer's going to stare down and get his man, do all that stuff. I remember listening to actually Jello Biafra of the Dead Kennedys on one of his spoken word albums because the Dead Kennedys went to trial for obscenity of what was inside one of their albums. And he does a whole bit about, you know, just how long a process is and how sort of un-rock and roll the whole thing really was. <laughs> but it was important to sort of go through all the steps and really share that with everybody and show sort of what's what's kind of done by, you know, sort of the experts, as it were. So now the the case came down, and just as we noted, it was a couple days before Christmas that you that you did finally win the right to be the slants and to and to get that name for yourself. And when you look at the news, when I'm looking at, again, just the quick search of The Slants, and like I said, 10 plus thousand hits, and again, Simon Tam of The Slants, thanks for taking the time to talk to Media Monarchy. We oh. appreciate it, especially sure. as you know the year's starting to wrap up, and it's a, it's a busy time for everyone. The other thing that's mentioned in just about every article mentioning your win, The Redskins. And I know I thought about it as soon as I was really reading that. So, of course, I wouldn't have been alone, and everyone's mind sort of went there. That's the other big sort of legal patent case where the Redskins are fighting for the right to have their name for the football team. And I know you've sort of been—now you're sort of, I believe what you're quoted saying, unlikely allies— in some yeah, ways. although that, that's a little bit of a mischaracterization. I think so. <laughs> um, but, you know, as a journalist, he thought it'd make a great headline. The Washington Post. So I think it's right there. Yeah. Um, so it's true. We, we can compare to them all the time. And a lot of people who do it do, do so without realizing that there are really important differences legally between our case and theirs. For example, our case was in the, the federal circuit. Theirs is in the Fourth Circuit. So our, um, the decision in our case actually isn't binding in their court. It's mm -hmm. most likely going to influence it, but, um, but it doesn't mean it's a slam dunk victory for, for the football team. Another thing is that our case dealt with mainly the First Amendment, but theirs deals with the Fifth Amendment, government seizure of property. And in this, in this case, it's their brand, their, mm. their good, the goodwill that they've amassed for like 80 years or something like that. Um, so there's a couple of like these really technical nuances that I'm sure that our, you know, judges and lawyers are going to be arguing, uh, for, for the next couple of months, but it, it's, it's fascinating to me because, uh, the media could have easily focused on our side of it and said, Hey, guess what? This outdated law that's been used to suppress the speech of minorities, it's finally gone. And said, they said, well, wait, wait a second. Does this mean Dan Snyder is going to win? And it, you know, even if it does, in a worst case scenario, like because I mean, most people can agree that 
what he's doing is, is pretty racist. It's derogatory to Native Americans. But even if he does win, um, at the end of the day, we're still removing laws that use race as a criteria to deny rape rights, which I would argue is a bigger, more just outcome. It's more equitable. But at the end of the day, even whether or not he wins or loses in court, um, he can still use the name. He doesn't need a trademark registration. In fact, he still owns many trademark registrations. They only canceled six of them. Mm. Um, not having a trademark registration doesn't prohibit someone from using it. And in fact, Dan Snyder vowed that he would never change the name. He was pretty adamant about that. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have a lot of incentive to. Uh, the NFL actually pays for all his legal bills, so it doesn't cost him any money to fight in court as long as he's been fighting. Isn't that handy? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous. But at, at the, also at the end of the day, we shouldn't be writing our laws around one football team. That'd be like us changing all of our free speech rights because people don't like what Donald Trump has to say. I, I mean, it doesn't really make sense mm -hmm. because how it affects everyday people matters more than how it affects a billionaire with unlimited resources. Now, as we noted, this story was huge. And you basically, not only you woke up to the success, but then as the days went by, you have to read again all these sort of mischaracterizations and putting <laughs> words in your mouth and, and sort of carrying on your fight for you in some ways. So I think to address a lot of that, you've got a great post that you just put up a couple of days ago on the slants.com when our story went viral addressing misconceptions about our case. And it's in there. And of course, we'll include that link in the show notes and of course to everything else that we mention on these shows. That is in there, and I think you 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 break it down really really well. Um, one question: Is the decision publicly available? You said the hundred and ten page. It is, yeah, yeah. The federal court actually publishes all of its okay. things for download, and so that's how news started breaking. And and the funny thing is, um, pretty much in every decision up until this point, the, every every time there something happened in court. Uh, the media would call and get our reaction. They would ask for statements and they would ask, you know, kind of fact check the mm -hmm. the details of the case. This time they didn't. Uh, so major media outlets like the New York Times inserted quotes that I never said. I never talked to their journalists. Uh, NPR put mis like inaccurate facts in their in their article. Everyone was just rushing to break the story, and so they didn't want to take the time to actually check those details. And when you have something like a 110-page opinion on an extremely obscure law that most mm -hmm. lawyers never deal with, um, it's just kind of a recipe for disaster. Well, and, you know, and these are not necessarily the media, but it's sort of we're dealing with the sort of same batch of people who, you know, don't read thousands of pages before they, you know, vote giant spending bills into law. Sure. And they're, they're not reading these things. They're just, like you just said, kind of rushing to judgment. I really like in your write-up about when your story went viral, how you kind of point out, and, and this kind of gets to the heart of maybe even in some way, I wasn't really thinking about this, when you're bringing in NPR and the New York Times, those are the big boys. They don't mess things up, right? <laughs> it's interesting that what your story turned into was only how it affects the Redskins, how it affects essentially a multinational, huge corporate brand. And that's yeah. the fascinating thing, I think, about what we've kind of seen going on, at least what I kind of see going on in the world. It's the big boys trying to regain control of what they've lost through the Internet. And there's been this effort to kind of bring everybody back into all having sort of the same couple of conversations. So what an interesting kind of misdirection that rather than celebrate your success, it's only instantly spun into, yes, but what does this mean for a massive sports conglomerate? Yeah, and it's like not everything should be about them. I mean, that's the kind of weird and sad thing. Like if if they didn't exist as a team or if Dan Snyder wasn't so stubborn mm -hmm. about how he approached things, how would those stories sound? Would the same people who are like kind of worried or upset about what what free speech means, would they still be just as worried? They probably probably not. I mean, all of the stories up until this point have been pretty focused on our struggle um our struggle for for you know using truth in courts instead of the kind of the false information that was presented and so it's been overwhelmingly positive and they all talked about 
what reappropriation meant and how important it is for mm -hmm. for identities who've been you know bullied or marginalized to to actually take control but it, it's it's interesting to see how like it always comes back down to to the money and ultimately that's what sells papers and gets people to click on links and and to listen to news stories i guess that's it that's it man i i really appreciate you taking the time and and we'll start to wrap this up but again i i implore people to to read your write-up because it gets into as you were talking about some of the, you know obscure legal terms and the Lanham Act and things that I'm <laughs> not familiar with, but you've got it broken down really, really well in your write up. So again, we'll leave people to go read that for themselves, as they should have all been reading for themselves <laughs> all along. Hey, um, I I really appreciate you taking the time, Simon Tam of the Slants, talking to Media Monarchy. Um. Anything as we are kind of wrapping up towards the end of the year? I know I, I always like to ask people if there's if there's favorite music they like. You and I kind of joked off mic for a little <laughs> bit. You've been so busy, you might not have been into necessarily 2015 music. However, you have new music coming very soon in 2016 from the Slants. Is that right? We do. We just finished uh, a national tour and recording a new album. Uh, called Something Slanted This Way Comes, which is kind of like a best of album because we pull uh, 15 songs from our back catalog. But instead of just doing a compilation of the same songs, we went back and re-recorded them and kind of reimagined the songs and gave them a little new, new, new flavor. And so we're really, really excited about this. Uh, it's dropping probably about April, although we're going to start doing pre-orders uh, pre on our album, uh, for our, on, on the album on our website really soon. Okay. And so it's right as we're heading off to, to Asia, we're going to be touring China, Taiwan, and Japan. We'll be launching this album and then coming back and working on brand new music if we're not getting dragged to the Supreme Court by the trademark <laughs> office. But you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> Who knows what 2016 may hold. So we will keep an eye out for Something Slanted This Way Comes, and we'll actually go out with the track Capture Me Burning from the upcoming album. And I think that's really kind of a great, it's a great way to sort of reintroduce yourself because again probably if you've been around for a while and you've had a little bit of lineup change in the band and sort of things have changed this is probably what better time to sort of kind of realign and reintroduce yourself to the world so i i wish you all sure. the luck <laughs> and i think that song is appropriate too i mean the, the key line from it is outcast rule this town and, and when you consider that everyone thought we were the underdog. Everyone told me that there was no way that we could win, um, but we finally we finally did it. I mean, we had the the president of the U.S. Uh, his his attorney called me to say, you know, it's not easy to take down the government, and you guys did it. Congratulations! This is a huge win for 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 marginalized people. Um, I had all kinds of interesting calls and conversations, but. Um, you know, we're certainly making progress for, for free speech and for, for people, and, and it's exciting for us. So I hope next year is spent a lot more time making and playing music yeah. and a lot less time in court. <laughs> <laughs> that's Yeah, that's the way you want to do it. Man, I really appreciate you taking the time. We're actually both in Portland, Oregon, but of course everything's so busy, the easiest thing to do was just hop on our separate Skype sure. setups. <laughs> but I would love to meet you and, and have a drink with you sometime soon here in Portland. Simon Tam of The Slants, thanks so much. Thank you so much.